Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the only presidential debate focused solely on one topic, the economy. Our panelists will provide an informed preview of tonight's debate, handicap the GOP race, and talk about the economic issues in play. We're privileged to have five seasoned panelists, all with ties to Dartmouth College, three award-winning writers who are also Dartmouth alumni and who have been reporting and commenting on the national political scene for decades, will join two distinguished Dartmouth professors whose insights are regularly featured by major national media outlets. Now a word about our moderator, Mort Kondracki. For more than 25 years, Dartmouth has hosted events for presidential candidates. Mort Kondracki was there at the start in 1984 when, De when Dartmouth held its first debate for the Democrats. Then Mort was a panelist at the debate, and we're pleased to welcome him back now to lead this esteemed panel. Mort Kondracki, a 1960 Dartmouth graduate and current member of our Board of Trustees, has been a national journalist for 41 years, the last 18 years as executive editor and columnist at Roll Call, the leading newspaper covering the U.S. Congress. He was a senior editor at the New Republic, Washington bureau chief of Newsweek, and a Wall Street Journal columnist. He is a Fox News commentator and was a regular panelist on the McLaughlin Group and on ABC's This Week. A Neiman Fellow at Harvard from 1973 to 74, he's also frequently appeared on Meet the Press and National Public Radio. I present the panelists for this afternoon's uh, session. Panelists are invited to come closer to the water if they choose. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I am Mort Kondracki, and um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, any of you who ever watched the McLaughlin Group will know that I'm not only glad to be here, I'm glad to be anywhere where I can finish a sentence without getting interrupted. <laughs> and uh, now I'm playing John McLaughlin, but I will do so more civilly than he, than he ever did. Um, our panel. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'll introduce the panel, and then I just want to. Then I'll explain how we're going to how we're going to proceed. David Shribman, class of 1976, is executive editor of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Uh, summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Dartmouth, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner in 1995, and a uh, former trustee of Dartmouth College. Uh, Joe Rago, uh, class of 05, Wall Street Journal editorial board member. Uh, also a Pulitzer Prize winner for covering health care, won his Pulitzer Prize in 2011. Matthew Slaughter is Associate Dean of the Tuck School of Business. Uh, from 2005 to 2007, he was on President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, uh, and he um, has, uh, uh, was, was in the Dartmouth uh, Economics Department from uh, 1994 until the time <coughs> he joined um, the, um, the CEA, and then he moved to Tuck when he, when he came back. Uh, Linda Fowler is professor of government, has been at Dartmouth since 1995, was director of the Rockefeller Center for Public, uh, Public Policy until 2004. She's the author of two books on Congress and is working on a, on a third. So the way we're going to do this is that we're, we will uh, talk about the debate and uh, and um, other presidential campaign issues for 40 minutes, and then we'll throw it open to the audience for, for questions. And uh, so, and, I, and I, what I hope you'll think of, think about, and I'm going to ask the panel about this too, is questions that you would like to see asked of the presidential candidates tonight, uh, especially non-obvious uh, questions that, that might be asked of the presidential candidates. I don't know uh, whether uh, the, the panelists are actually watching us, the, uh, the questioners are actually watching us, but in case they are, maybe, maybe we can get, inject some, some new um, uh, uh, queries into the, into the mix. Okay, um, so first of all, let me, uh, let me cover some, uh, uh, some news, uh, some of the news and events of the day and, and get them out of the way and just get your comment on uh, what impact you think they will have on the presidential race and on tonight's debate, the most obvious of which is Governor uh, Chris Christie's endorsement of Mitt Romney today, um, and previously, by the way, uh, Judd Gregg's um, endorsement of, of, of Mitt Romney. Linda, you're an expert on New Hampshire politics. What difference will that make for the New Hampshire race, tonight's debate, and 
the race in general? Well, there's certainly cements Romney's position as front runner, um, and particularly with many of the Republican donors who have been so reluctant to um, fund any of the candidates right now. What we're in now is what's called the invisible primary. Most of what we're seeing now is for the benefit of activists, donors, journalists, political junkies like us. and. Uh, they will take this as a significant sign that the Republican establishment, at least, is beginning to coalesce around Romney as the front runner. Matthew? Um, so <clears throat> if I think about the topic of tonight's debate being economics, um, I think there's a signal there. I think one of the things that has attracted um, a lot of people to Governor Christie was his willingness to take on a lot of the strong um, and challenges of how the New Jersey economy is doing, what are the tough fiscal choices facing that state, so I think there's a message to the broader voters in America when Governor Christie casts his preference with uh, Governor Romney. And similarly, Judd Gregg, at least in New Hampshire here, I think a well-regarded senior statesman of the state, um, former governor, representative, senator, and importantly on these budget issues, I think a real voice of moderation acknowledging there's going to be some hard choices. David? I think from its uh, days as a scotch and soda cocktail party to a um, tea party, the Republicans have been less a party than a fraternal lodge. <laughs> and uh, I think the, um, the ascendancy of Governor Romney, he's the next guy, that there's some logic to it, and that uh, that's why you see these people ha um, hanging out with him and signing up with him. And uh, in this lodge, and you'll see some of the members of the lodge tonight, in this lodge, it's, it's his turn. Well, I think his laying on of hands of, of uh, Romney is, is real important because... It, there's a huge sense of dissatisfaction, you know, among activists, conservative journalists, uh, especially donors, with with the current field. Um, you know, it's kind of these these knuckleheads, and Romney has his has his own problems. Uh, so his his endorsement, Christie's endorsement, as one of the people that people were trying to um, uh, conscript into the race. Uh, you know, whether it's Mitch Daniels or Paul Ryan. Uh, some of the other um, maybe more serious or more thoughtful uh, Republicans, uh, Christie's endorsement uh, has a big effect there. So it's uh, not. It's obviously not over, right? It, it, but it's a big. It's a big step for Romney. Yeah, and I, I think um, you know, if there were somebody better than Romney, I think Christie would have endorsed him. Uh, and I think you're going to see all these guys coming in and going. Well, look down the line, uh, and Romney is the most plausible, and we're going to make our peace with him. So, so what's, what is, what's the effect going to be on the debate tonight? Is, are people going to say, going to try to separate Christie from Romney and try to find, find ways of diminishing the importance of this endorsement? I think, um, although I'm, I, I cherish the notion of sitting to the right of the guy from the Wall Street Journal, um, uh, I, 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 but you're I, not. Well, from their point of view, I am. Yeah. From their point of view, yeah. So um, the, I think it's, it's, it's the other guy's opportunity or actually their obligation to try to separate themselves from the rest of this pack so as to emerge as the alternative to uh, Romney because I think, as Linda says, um, and Joe as well, Romney really has solidified his position. Right yeah. Um, I would I would just expect that we're going to have some uh, some effort to paint Christie as an establishment kind of figure, kind of a you know soft I mean uh, in favor of gun control, soft on immigration, all that kind of stuff, in order to separate the two of them from from the rest of what the Republican Party thinks. So um, second second big event today was the discovery of this plot to. Uh, assassinate the the, U, the Saudi ambassador to the United States by the Iranians. Is that going to have any effect tonight? This is an economics debate. I don't think so. Okay, I don't. So, I don't think so either. <laughs> third, third, uh, third item. <laughs> third item. Of, third. I just wanted to get it off the table. Uh, third item of news um, is the sort of almost universal denunciation of the pastor who. Uh, slurred Mormonism at last week's Values Voters Summit in, in, in Washington. You know, the pastor was introducing um, uh, the Governor Perry and sort of implied that, that, Perry, was, that Perry was better than Romney because he's a real Christian 
And, Ron, and Perry said he knocked it out of the park, didn't he? And today, at the, at the endorsement uh, event, um, Romney really sort of pinned it on, on Perry. Now, every, almost every commentator that I've seen has said this has no place in the Republican Party. So does, does Perry get really hurt from this, do you think, Joe? Well, I, th I think it reflects a larger problem with his campaign that, you know, it, it stood up in just a few months uh, and, and doesn't really have its sea legs yet. Uh, so it, it, he really needed to denounce this guy, uh, not to come off, um, you know, like an anti-Mormon bigot. Uh, and, and instead, he kind of, he dropped the ball here. Um, it, it doesn't speak well of the professionalism of the, of the Perry campaign. Anybody else have anything to add? Okay. Um, let me ask you a bigger, a bigger yeah. question. What do you think the American people are looking for in a president in the 2012 election? Well, they're looking for Superman, but they've been doing that for a while now. Um, but on a more serious note, I, I, I do believe that the country is very concerned about the future of this country, not just the economy, but we've never seen poll numbers that we're now seeing about the number of people who think it's going in the wrong direction. Um, and, um, and I think given the political opportunities that the economy provides for the Republicans right now, it's surprising to me that they haven't actually talked more about it and more concretely. And so this is their opportunity to do that tonight. And if they don't, I think they will have missed an important opportunity. Yeah. Uh, no, what they need to talk about is is economic growth. I mean, we're we're in a growth recession right now. Um, this is this is the major issue. You cannot um, put people back to work uh, unless the economy is growing. Uh, and I think the the only guy who's really talking about this in a very sustained um, way is is Mitt Romney. Uh, don't don't agree with all his proposals. Um, you know, it's kind of a kind of a hash. Uh, but he knows that this election is going to be uh, about the economy, referendum on Obama's economic policies, uh, and, and I think he's got the right focus, if, if, not, if not always the right message. Has he, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan gave, gave us a, a, a sense of optimism, even, the, even in the depths of uh, stagflation in, in 1980, that we really could do it. And I don't really sense from Romney that he's that ebullient about things. I mean, he, he's, he's whacking away at Obama, but I don't hear a great optimistic growth message that I have the answer and here's where we're going and follow me. Do you? No. Uh, I think the thing to understand about Mitt Romney is he's a Bain and Company consultant. He's a technocrat uh, to the core. Uh, he, he believes in getting all the smartest people in the room, uh, hash out their differences, and come out with a technocratic solution. Uh, and um, you know, I, I was I was with him uh, on the on the campaign trail yesterday. Uh, constantly reinforces, you know, private sector uh, expertise, businessman. <laughs> I'm the turnaround artist. I know what to do. Uh, but but he doesn't have sort of that doesn't really fit into a larger message uh, about either either economic growth or the direction of the country. It's kind of he believes in his own expertise, and he'll tell you about it. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think the public is looking for? What is well, the I think the public is gravely concerned and with very, very good reason. There's not one indicator in this particular round that, that's, that's encouraging. The, the market has had some good days, but the market generally is, is bad. The number of, if you look at uh, statistics, I think it was in the journal today, the number of, uh, number of people who are graduating with engineering degrees in the United States versus other countries, uh, number of people who have college degrees in the United States versus others as Joe says, growth. And the problem I think that Mitt Romney has is he may have, you know, a nine million plan, nine million point plan, but there isn't a soul on earth, except maybe his wife, who's passionately for him. And, uh, and yeah, of course, she has one of those great jokes about that. I think I'll let her tell it. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the problem is Ronald Reagan, from the beginning of his political career in 1966, and Mort, you'll remember this as well, had people who were passionately for him, people who considered themselves Reagan people from 66 on, in 68 as well, and when he ran in 76, and then again in 80. There was a real passion. People believed in Ronald Reagan, and they identified themselves as Reagan people. 
if you can find somebody who identifies himself as a Romney person, call me collect. <laughs> Matt? So I want to pick up on something Linda said, and it echoes what um, Joe and David said. I think there's two numbers that a lot of American households are sitting around tonight wondering who's going to help, help explain and provide a solution to. And one is September of 1999. Uh, that number is, refers to the fact that how damaged the American labor market is in terms of the number of jobs. So today, there's about 109 million private sector jobs in the United States, and the number we have today is the same number we had 12 years ago in September of 1999. So that's one reason, you know, upwards of 80% of Americans are saying America's on the wrong track right now. But I think the other one is not just jobs, but the incomes of those jobs. And the second number is the year 1989. Um, A couple of weeks ago, the U.S. Census Bureau put out the annual report on incomes and poverty in the United States. And in 2010, the median household in America, its earnings was $49,445. That's only about $369 above what it was in 1989 when you adjust for price inflation. So the typical household in America today is sitting there wondering how we're in a situation where we have fewer private sector jobs than we did a decade ago, and the typical household is just barely breaking even or worse off. Um, and I think the difference between Ronald Reagan in 1983, then we had, we had a very deep recession in the early 90s that was largely triggered by the Fed to break inflation. And the recovery you tend to get from those um, central bank <coughs> monetary tightening induced recoveries, recessions, is really, really stark. You know, September of 1983, in one month, the U.S. economy grew a million jobs in just one month. This recession is very different because it was triggered by a financial crisis. You've got the ongoing pressures, like you mentioned, with China and India and those other countries. And, um, I think almost by definition it's a harder starting point to tell a story, but I think a lot of Americans want to hear somebody tell a story for what's causing this and what they're going to try to do to get out of it. But most Republicans tend to blame this thing on Obama for not getting, out, uh, not getting us out of it. Um, they don't, they don't, I, I've never heard a Republican say that a financial uh, downturn is harder to get out of than a... Than a uh, I hope I hope somebody will ask tonight. You know that many economists say right. that if, that this was a financial crisis that it's harder to get out of. What do you think about that, candidates? Don't, wouldn't that be a legitimate question? It'd be a legitimate and great question to hear asked, and I'd, and I'd love to hear the answers. Um, we, I, I think reasonable people can talk about whether the policy choices of the past couple of years of Congress and the administration have been wise or not in trying to help address these things. But the pervasiveness, I think, of the economic pressures that face the U.S. right now. Um, you know, the president's a powerful person, whoever it is, but there's, there's limits to that office, and, and these forces are a lot bigger than who's in the White House. The Wall Street Journal doesn't think that it's harder to get out of a financial crisis than it is, does it? I mean, of, it, of course. It, I mean, does, it, does it really? I've look, never seen you, that I mean, look, you, you, you have to separate elective politics from journalistic interpretation, <laughs> uh, I think. But uh, no, clearly there are, there are uh, much deeper problems at work uh, in, in the economy than just Obama's choices. I don't think Obama's choices have, have uh, helped, certainly helped matters. Uh, but but um, it, it's exactly right. You know, if you look at uh, new business starts, uh, they're down over the last decade versus the decade before. Um, rising health care costs are eating into incomes, you know, just that all the money we're spending on health care is not showing up in, in paychecks as wages. Uh, so there, there's absolutely deeper problems. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of Washington has, I think, uh, they, they sort of view the economy as, mm-hmm. as this <coughs> Newtonian system uh, where, you know, you cut taxes and you get a response or you pass a stimulus uh, and, and growth will rebound. And, and that's not really the way it works. Um, on the other hand, running for office is different from being an economist or being a journalist. Linda? Well, there's a lot of survey evidence that voters are quite myopic about the economy um, and that in the past, Republicans have always been very good at pumping up the economy in the fourth year before a Republican has to run for election. Democrats have always done badly at that. Um, so I think we're seeing this is part of a much larger pattern that we've seen and voters tend to look at what's happening recently. Um, and George Bush the first was a victim of that kind of myopia in, 90, in the 92 election, where the economy had actually started to come back, but he didn't get any credit for it. So um, I think the, the sophistication of voters is 
pretty limited on these kinds of issues, and so they're easily, um, they find it easy to forget whose recession this really is, I think. And I think that's absolutely right, and what struck me throughout this entire period is how the main tenets, save, of course, the stimulus, but the main tenets of the um, Obama economic policy were actually set in motion by President George W. Bush. TARP has its antecedents there. The um, bailout of, of uh, industries and companies that were too big to fail all began in the, in the George W. Bush administration. And so, you know, it's tough luck for President Obama. He ran on the notion that he would make it his economy. Well, it's his. And tough luck for him right now. But I am struck at how people have forgotten that some of the major tenets of this of the Obama plan, so-called, really are the George W. Bush plan. And that's true not only in the economy, uh, Mort, but it's also true in foreign policy and in uh, law enforcement and Guantanamo and Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. You never hear a Republican candidate mention the words George W. Bush. I have never, I've never heard them mention it. Well, the, he, the man who wasn't there. If he was still alive, then we would... Uh, <laughs> we would uh, <laughs> uh, the person I have heard refer to George W. Bush is Barack Obama, uh, and you know he would like to blame his problems on on uh, on uh, George Bush. And and but I want I do want to ask about Obama. Um, he's play, clearly trying to play Harry Truman, you know, uh, running against the do nothing Republican Party, do nothing Congress, putting out a jobs plan that everybody knows has no chance of, of passing in. With, but which, which has popular elements, including raising taxes on rich people. Um, so he's down at, down in the low 40s. Uh, everybody says that a president going into an election year in the low 40s is has no chance to win. Uh, do you think he can pull it off? Linda? Well, the Truman analogy, according to my colleague Brendan Nyan, is a forced one. When Truman was running against the do nothing Congress, he was also experiencing a quite nice increase in GDP. Um, at the same time, um, the, the, the models that people use to predict uh, the outcomes of presidential races all say when you get down into the 40s in approval and when GDP growth is low, which it is now, um, those are the big determinants of the popular vote. So um, I don't think there's any political scientist who thinks it will be anything other than close. But I don't think, I think what we're talking about is within the plus or minus margin of error here. And, um, and <clears throat> I think the, Repu the Republicans have a terrific opportunity, but they shouldn't assume that they just get to run on a narrow set of issues and, and win this election. So? Well, yeah, I mean, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Uh, but um, <laughs> I, think it, I think it depends on, on who the Republicans nominate. Um, well, I, say, I, they, say they nominate Romney. Uh, I still think it'll be head to head, but, but who knows? Um, it'll, it'll, I, I think it'll be very close just because of uh, the relative weakness of the GOP field. Um, and um, I, you know, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a pretty vicious campaign. Um, I don't see how it couldn't be. Um, you know, it's it's going to be all attacks from the Republicans on Obama and vice versa. Um, so I, I think it's going to be it's going to be messy, uh, and it's going to come down to uh, to the wire. But don't don't have any models to uh, to say one way or the other. More, I think what troubles me about the president and his prospects right now is that he, he's an American original, born in Hawaii by most accounts, uh, <laughs> and having been reared in uh, Indonesia and um, having uh, been educated both on the West Coast and in Colombia. Couldn't get into Dartmouth, apparently. Um, uh, and, you know, with a mixed race and a mixed outlook, an international outlook, he's an original. And yet he seems to want to say, well, I'm... I'm like Ronald Reagan, or I'm doing a Harry Truman now, and he should be Barack Obama rather than Harry Truman uh, Redux or rather than, um, rather than Ronald Reagan. And I think that's one of his problems, is that he hasn't figured out, he hasn't figured out or let himself be him. And, of course, we used to remember the phrase, let Reagan be Reagan. We haven't seen Obama be Obama. 
since the Pennsylvania primary in, in April of 19, in 2008. I think that's that more than any of the rest of this is Obama's problem. So who is Obama? Well, he has to answer that for us. I mean, you know, we're Have expert. you seen the real Obama? I saw him for about 15 minutes around the corner one day. And, <laughs> but I mean, um, that's for him to tell us. Not for, I mean, we make a living. It's a cheap living, but we make a living by telling everybody who Obama is and who Reagan was. But he needs to tell us who Obama is, and he hasn't done so. I mean, I, I detect a certain Jimmy Carter-ish um, well, there you go again, Mr. Aura. President. Uh, <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the all of a sudden doing this uh, quote-unquote class warfare thing um, looks kind of desperate, and it looks like he's blaming other people. You know, take off your bedroom slippers and, and get into action as though it's, it's somebody else's fault. Um, and that, and if, that, if that model holds then people will look at the debates when they happen, the presidential debates, and they'll see if the Republican candidate is credible, it could be a landslide, I mean, if, if that model So follows. we could have Jimmy Carter running against George, H., George W. Bush. Okay, this is getting too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when, I'll, I'll, Americans, I think, I agree with Linda that, um, you know, not everybody gets, not even economists get all the macro models on assigning cause and effect on, on what policy had one impact. But I just know from things I've done over the years, my reading of public opinion evidence, Americans are pretty sophisticated pocketbook voters. They know when they're doing well and they know when they're not doing well. You know, yeah. you want to you know who knows some of the most sophisticated thing about global economics? Go to any manufacturing plant in the Midwest and you talk to folks on the production line. They will tell you about the currency risks they face and how oil prices... You won't find anybody on the production line. You'll find... <laughs> well, okay, so here's, here's the great point. So there's 11.7 million Americans that work in manufacturing today. Anybody... I'll give a, a breakfast at Lou's tomorrow morning. Anybody can tell me the last time we had 11.7 million Americans working in U.S. manufacturing? Only 1820. Uh, no, close, though. A April of 1941. So I, I think my, the point I'll make here is, if you want a simple answer, we'll build back the manufacturing jobs. We'll get the fat cat CEOs on their corner. How do we jobs. do that? Um, none of that's going to address these issues. And so I think, I think Americans, one of the things I'm struck by is when you look at, Americans tend to be very, my rating of public opinion surveys is, we're really, we're really optimistic. You know, and even if you look at, a, at questions, those kind of low frequency questions about how your kid's going to do in the future, Go back to earlier recessions, and even coming out of those recessions, slight to noticeable majorities of Americans still said, yeah, we just came through a recession, but I think my children's generation is going to be better off, my kids will be better off than I am. Not now. Right now, two-thirds of Americans say, I do not think my kid's generation uh, will have a better standard of living than I do. So, there, so there's an opportunity, I don't know whether it's President <laughs> Obama or whoever the Republican candidate emerges to be, again, to, to speak to that. And if it's going to be simplistic or kind of mean, I'm not sure that's going to resonate with, with a lot of people in, who do have the manufacturing jobs or the services jobs or the one in six underemployed Americans in the U.S. And, well, to, and to put what Matt says into context, the last time there were that few industrial jobs, there wasn't a lose. It was six years yeah. before lose started. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, the so <laughs> I mean, you, yeah. Yeah, now, the, the Wall Street Journal, <clears throat> had, uh, at least according to the Huntsman campaign, says that the Huntsman economic plan is the best plan for getting American growth together. You, did you write that editorial? I did not. Okay, do you agree with that point? Oh. I would, I would <laughs> say it's a, good, it's a good economic plan. Uh, so not not going to make not going to make uh, any endorsements, but um, you know you've you've got gestures at some of these long-term uh, undercurrents uh, that are that are dragging down growth. Uh, you've got pro-growth tax policy. You know, broaden the base, lower the rates, uh, clear out the loopholes, get rid of the deductions. Uh, so it's a tax um, sim tax simplification. Um, the, uh, but Huntsman, I would say, is the winner by default. Um, you know, Mitt Romney's 59-point economic plan, um, you know, it, it's got some good stuff in there, uh, but it's also got his uh, trade war with China uh, platform, um, which I think would be a, a huge mistake. You know, one of the major mistakes of the Great Depression that we've so far avoided 
uh, is, is having a trade war, uh, raise, raising tariffs on imports, um, you know, uh, currency, currency issues. Um, and, uh, you know, the only other one with the economic plan, as far as I can tell, um, it, it, aside from um, Rick Perry's, have you heard how great Texas is? Let's, let's all be Texas, uh, is, is Herman Cain with his 999 plan. Uh, and so it's a 9% VAT, uh, 9% corporate profits tax, and 9% income tax. And it, it's just unrealistic uh, and, and destructive uh, in a lot of ways, it's well, especially, especially for low-wage earners. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to have a consumption tax and a 9% tax. Um, these, these are people who are not paying taxes right now. And, you know, you, you want, except, except for payroll taxes, uh, I should say, <laughs> excuse me, although that is social insurance uh, yeah. system, not, not but income taxes. it's about 9%. But, I'll go <laughs> but, you know, Joe, <clears throat> Romney has 59 points. Woodrow Wilson had 14. God had 10. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Reagan had one. Are we, 59, are we worried that there's no one vision of this whole thing from any of the candidates, not only Romney? I, I think that's a, that's a huge problem. You know, they, they, yeah. As I said, they, they haven't really made a larger narrative about how they, they haven't crafted a larger narrative about how we ended up uh, at our current juncture. Uh, and, and that's a failure, especially in a presidential contest where People, people are looking at these two guys, sizing them up, uh, and, and saying, who's the plausible president? Which, where's my vote going to go? This whole problem of narrative, I think, is what needs to start being sorted out. And I think that's why the journalists are paying so much attention to this debate, even though the viewership of Bloomberg is relatively small. But I think people are wondering when is the narrative about what the Republicans are for and what they would do if entrusted with governing. Um, it, it, that hasn't coalesced yet. And, and <clears throat> part of the problem is that you do have to tell the story of what caused it. And that raises all these difficult questions for yeah. Republicans. So um, I, think it's, I think it's a real challenge for them. And that's why we've seen their economic plans are really about biography. I made more job, you know, I was a job creator or I um, did these, and, and at some point, I mean, that's pretty persuasive for a while. So, so yeah. what, is the, what is the question that one of these questioners should ask tonight about to get this, this vision thing or the, or the narrative going? Is there, how would you frame a question to them to try to elicit what they think in broad terms? Anybody? So, so I'll take a crack. I'd, be, I'd have a, it could be a retrospective one of how did we kind of get here, mm -hmm. but maybe a prospective one is to tell us tell us your story and maybe try to frame it not point sixteen and forty two. Those may be part of it, but what's your vision for how America builds the millions and millions of new jobs it needs to, to rebuild the the balance sheets and income statements of American households and and do it in a way that is sustainable for for the future? Because because I think one of the key things is. No disrespect to retail trade and home building, but if we go back to that driving economic growth, that's part of what laid the foundation of the world financial crisis. It's got to be millions of jobs linked to uh, international trade and investment and to the, the, the ongoing dynamism of the world economy. David? You know, I'm an editor. I'm supposed to change everybody's words, but I wouldn't change a word of what Matt said. I'd go with what he said. Um, so Dr. Do you have any notion of what the question is that... that gets to this? No, but just to, to build on the point, um, you know, not, not only home building, but health care and education are sectors that have negative productivity rates, right. and we're putting more and more national resources into those two industries every year. I'm sorry, uh, education and? Health care. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of, lot of pockets of innovation uh, in, in both fields, but overall negative productivity, and that's dragging down economic growth. Therefore, we should do what? Or they, therefore, the question to them is, how would you increase the productivity of the education and healthcare sectors? Right, and I, I think, you know, resources that we devote to uh, things that, well, we're not getting a marginal benefit. Uh, you need to put those into something productive, um, in, in savings and investment. Well, I think 
the 800-pound gorilla is how we continue to pay for wars um, that the public has stopped supporting and how we can um, redesign our military apparatus in a way that is more cost-effective. And none of the candidates, of course, wants to touch that, and I believe Ron Paul does. <clears throat> That's true, and, and uh, Mitt Romney actually is calling for a fairly substantial increase in defense spending. And um, if health care is one of the 800-pound gorillas in the looming deficit crisis, the shorter-term one is military spending and what we really want to pay for. I, w I would like to see somebody ask, um, what is the role of the big banks in all of this? I'd like to see someone answer that. <laughs> well, there are books about it. Gretchen Morgan right. Stern of the New York Times and, and uh, Michael Lewis have written books um, which basically blame the banks for the, for, for the whole thing. Well, Gretchen blame, blames F, the F, the Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae, yeah. right. Uh, but Fannie Mae was the, was the origin of it. Alan Greenspan contributed to it. But the banks, you know, invented the, the, the instruments and never knew, never understood, never <coughs> never fessed up to what they were invent inventing if they knew what they were inventing. So, uh, you know, what is, the, what is the role of the big banks and what would you do about it is a question that I would like to see these yeah. guys answer. And maybe they'll say, you know, all we have to do is repeat, repeal Dodd-Frank and everything will be okay. But That's, uh, it, that's what they will say. Well, I, And I know you don't accept that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, <clears throat> I wouldn't. And the other thing that I'd like to have them... Uh, um, explore uh, uh, monetary policy. I have not heard, except for saying that Ben Bernanke is is devaluing the currency, and um, I have not heard anybody explain what monetary policy ought to be, how it how it affects all this. I mean, I've heard people say that if we went on back on the gold standard, for example, um, <coughs> that uh, that you know we that a lot of our, our manufacturing problems would go away. Now, the gold standard is a kind of a weird subject to bring up, but don't you think it ought to be brought up? No, but I, I think... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, look, we're, no, we're not going back to the gold standard. I mean, it's, it's kind of silly to, to suggest that. But, uh, you know, should... should Lou Lehrman thinks should, should. Should the Federal Reserve be pursuing a rules-based monetary policy or kind of the... Uh, uh, Ben Bernanke uh, Improvisation Act that, that we've seen since 2003? I, th I think that's, that's a fair question to ask, certainly. You know, I, uh, as, as critical as we all have been of this Republican field, and of course um, my uh, friend Susan Block in Pittsburgh says that she'd feel better if she could find at least two of them who believed in evolution. But um, <laughs> uh, this is a... F f Generally speaking, a more economically literate, you may be horrified by this, yeah. a more economically literate group than most, yeah. than almost any 20th century president. I mean, remember John Kennedy didn't remember what the difference between fiscal and monetary policy was, and they had to tell him, well, remember, M for McChesney and M for monetary. Um, um, McChesney Martin was the um, uh, chairman of the Fed. So, I mean, these guys are more sophisticated about, have a more sophisticated and better developed view than President Truman did, than President Roosevelt did, than President Coolidge did, than President Hard Harding did, uh, and then uh, President Nixon, President Johnson. I think we ought to give them at least that. I, if, if a question about the Fed is asked, I'd love to hear a candidate offer a ringing endorsement for the statutory independence of the Fed. And I would say to credit the Fed chairman for the innovation to help us stay out of a depression. Um, History is quite clear. Countries that have more politicized central banking tend to have lower rates of economic growth, higher rates of price inflation, more volatile price inflation. So when I'm a little more worried, the fact that we've got a, 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 one of the candidates will be on the stage who, if elected, would probably aim to shut down the Federal Reserve. Um, that's Ron Paul. That's Ron Paul, that's um, who chairs the House, Mon House Financial Services Subcommittee that has oversight over monetary policy. Um, that hopefully gives folks some pause. Other questions that you'd like to see asked? Questions. Well, I yeah. I think we should let the audience. Yeah. Okay. Questions All right. <laughs> open open to the audience now. The the um, I guess the best way to do it is to I can't really see back there, but other people can who have microphones. So raise your hand, and um, a microphone will come to you. There's somebody in the back there. Well. 
Uh, you've talked about uh, a lot of very uh, complex issues that are uh, facing the country today. One thing you haven't addressed is how does any successful president deal with a polarized uh, Congress that is held in even lower regard than the current president at 11 percent? And uh, so the great ideas are fine, but how do you get them into place? David. I, I just want to say that on, on, about polarization, when a um, long, long time ago, when I was young and when we were young, there were liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. And uh, that was deplored by your antecedents, your uh, political scientist friends, who said, you know, what we need in America is uh, our, our, our party discipline and, and ideological parties, because this doesn't work. Well, we got those. And um, thank you very much, Silsby Hall. Um, because... Uh, <laughs> And now, the most liberal Republican is more conservative. No, the, the most liberal Republican, the, there's no interchange between Republicans and Democrats, okay? There's no um, overlap. Uh, Olympia Snow, who's probably the most liberal Republican, is now more conservative than the most conservative Democrat. In 1935, when the Social Security Act was passed, President Roosevelt was able to sign that in law with bipartisan support, even though uh, Alf Landon ran against it in... Um, uh, four, three years later, when President, um, <coughs> President Johnson was able to get the uh, next great social experiment, Medicare, passed, with all, about 35% of Republicans voted for that. Zero Republicans voted for the health care plan. I think, that's, I think that's at the center of our problem, and I blame the political science uh, department uh, <laughs> at, Har at Harvard, but maybe not Dartmouth. <laughs> well, the polarization, as a resident of Silsby, I guess I have to speak up here. Um, I would say, David, you know that old saying from Pogo, we has met the enemy and he is us. Right, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the research going on in Silsby right now is, uh, is whether this polarization is being driven by activists and elites who have hijacked the primary process and have dominated the political financing of campaigns rather than the parties. They've really overshadowed the parties in terms of allocating money, or whether, in fact, voters themselves have become more polarized and they are applying these perceptual screens to the world. So Republicans, for example, see the economy as being worse than um, other people. Um, and, um, and so everybody is kind of using their partisanship to say what the facts are. And um, so that's not just Congress, that's, it's us. No, I think, I, I agree, I think it's both. I think yeah. you have, you have a, a, a sorted electorate who, yeah, Democrats and Republicans live in different worlds. I mean, liberals all watch MSNBC, conservatives all watch Fox News and they have a totally different view of reality. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's all of the above. But, but I, one question that arises out of this is, does anybody think that there's a prayer for this America elects organization which is trying to get, a, get, get ballot access for an as yet unnamed independent candidate for president in 50 states uh, who will be chosen sometime later by some magical internet voting system. But I mean, does, it, is there a moderate alternative to what we see that has any realm of possibility? But boy, don't you think that the independent movements that have had at least some impact, <coughs> Eugene Debs, Ross Perot, even John Anderson, they, uh, George Wallace, they've been personality driven rather than, I mean, they've had the personality and then they make up some phony party like the American Independent Party or whatever it was, the crackpot party that, um, that Ross Perot had. Um, it, it doesn't usually work this way. Right. Maybe, except it. the Republican Party maybe in 1856, but usually it doesn't work that way. Anybody have a, think it has a prayer? I don't either, but... <clears throat> okay, questions from the audience. There's one right down here. Well, let's see, you, you people with the microphones, you find somebody that you like. Because <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, yesterday I saw a paper by Scott Baker and Nick Bloom of Stanford, as well as Stephen Davis of Chicago Booth. It was entitled Measuring Economic Policy Uncertainty. 
Uh, and they claim they developed an index of policy-induced economic uncertainty uh, and did a vector autoregression of the last 30 years. They claimed that uh, if we could reduce the policy-induced economic uncertainty to the levels that prevailed uh, in 2006 and before, that would add about 2.5 million jobs to the economy over a year and a half. Now, obviously, that's not the whole picture, but they're claiming that's a significant enough picture that we can't ignore policy and just uncertainties, effects on business investment. So um, one, from a policy perspective, do any of you have any concrete policy ideas that might be able to reduce the level of, of uh, policy uncertainty? And second, uh, would any of the candidates be able to actually address <coughs> that this evening, in your opinion? Good Should question. Should we be doing veto? Yeah, there's going to be a quiz handed out. Policy, so re policy, policy, policy regressions in the middle of a recession? No, I, I, it creates jobs. <laughs> so, um, so, it's a, it's a, it, so that's a great question. You hear in, in the media a lot of business leaders talk about policy uncertainty. Um, many people in this room far smarter than I know you raise the uncertainty around a business decision and the decision of that business to wait and not undertake that hiring, that capital investment goes up. You know, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, his doctoral dissertation at MIT was on precisely this issue. Um, the challenge is how do you quantify it and how do you change it? Um, I, that's one of those sort of magic wand things that I wish I knew what to do to make small and large business owners feel less uncertain than they do today. Part of it is the policy process. I just, part of what I think people forget sometimes, we talk about the super committee now thinking about $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction. Well, nobody really quite knows what they're going to do, and then there's going to be bickering that comes out of whatever they might do. And every week and month that that goes on, a lot of small and large business owners in America are not sure what their personal tax rate, their corporate tax rate, their payroll tax rate is for these key business decisions. So it's a great question, and I'll, I, I don't know what the answer is. Maybe we'll hear something from some of the, the um, debate uh, participants tonight. But the other thing that we need to keep in mind in America is what a lot of these executives see is this uncertainty in the United States juxtaposed with the dynamism and the growth and, frankly, the greater policy certainty that they see in a lot of the brick and beyond countries. A lot of these countries have much, in some basic sense, a lot better economic policy than we do today. And that matters for a lot of the decisions these companies make. Namely, no, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Joe. No, I think one other problem, especially if you're talking about policy or regulatory uncertainty, is, is the problem of delegation. Uh, where Congress used to pass specific statutes uh, <clears throat> saying, saying what the law is going to be, thoroughly debated in the committees. Now they give sort of general instructions to the, uh, to the agencies. They say, you know, you, yeah. you figure this out, uh, put, get in the Federal Register, uh, and, and everything will be fine. So there's, there's a lot more administrative discretion uh, in, in what the government does, and um, particularly if you're, you know, trying to overhaul um, air pollution regulations or, or uh, the, the Dodd-Frank bill, for instance. Yeah, Finn Reg's a great bill. example. So much of that has been left to the discretion of regulators. No disrespect to them. They're good public servants. But what that means is lots of firms and banks and financial firms aren't quite sure what the rules are going to be in the coming months and years. And it's a huge boom huge industry for, uh, for lobbyists and uh, yep. Uh, consultants. Yep. But, that's, so, but that's partly the result of partisan divisions in the Congress that because they can't agree on language, yes. they know they have to do something, so they write vague statutes that can yep. pass, or overly specific ones that protect a huge number of individuals or exempt them. So um, to what extent is policy uncertainty just another word for gridlock and polarization? Well, if I'm not mistaken, most of the, most of the, uh, the Republican candidates have said, <coughs> one, that they would do, do away with Obamacare, which is does create uncertainties, among, among other things. They would have regulatory holidays. They would uh, cut corporate taxes. The, some of them would have a tax reform, which, is, which would create uncertainties, because lots of businesses depend on their, on their loopholes for you know, income. But generally speaking, don't, haven't they said what they would do about to eliminate uncertainty? Or do you think not? I, I don't think so. I think it, it, it's, it, it's going to be very difficult to eliminate uncertainty. Um, I, I think the, however the election shakes out, I think we'll give, put a lot more certainty into the process about what the policy environment is going to look like going forward. I mean, if uh, Romney but, gets elected president and, and the Senate goes Republican, 
and the, how, and the, the uh, Republicans retain control of the House, uh, I'm not sure we're going to like what what comes out, but there will be there will be some certainty, won't there? Well, but, you might not like it. <coughs> there, there was huh? enough. You might not like it. But... What? We had unified party control after the 2008 election, and that didn't produce more certainty. Okay. Well, there's also election. there's certainty <laughs> about good <laughs> policies and uncertainty about bad policies that I think is an important distinction. Uh, if we're right. returning to the uh, super majorities in, in 2008. Yeah, I mean, uh, what 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 ha what happens classically? I mean, you know, the, the the part talking about polarization is that the two parties fight to get control of the government so that they can do things their way, and then when they start doing things their way, the country thinks that they've gone too far in one direction and throws them out again. So you know, which is what happened to the to the Democrats. Question. Anybody? If I had a chance to talk at the debate, I would ask them <laughs> how, did, how they would get business more involved in the community. For example, our education. Uh, the manufacturers could help the schools because in the schools are the future workers. The hospitals, future workers. Uh, instead of having vouchers, why not, in addition to the parents who have their children there, the community help? Instead of saying, I don't want to pay higher taxes, say, let me help my community. It seems that people go through the education system, and then after they're out, they don't want to pay for other people's children. But I would ask how these candidates could get their businesses involved to help, and then in turn, we would help the businesses. Can I offer a reaction? I think that's a great idea. And the one thing in particular I'd point out is that um, the median voter in the U.S., the median person in the American labor force, has a high school degree and about one year of post-high school education. And so that person, I think it's fair to say our educational system does an increasingly poor job on sort of preparing them for, um, to have the skills to try to earn a decent living and hopefully a, a rising standard of living in, in today's global economy. And when you look at manufacturers, the National Association of Manufacturers, a bunch of companies have done studies. The biggest constraint a lot of these firms cite today um, is skills and talent. You know, these manufacturers, that, the reality of today is in manufacturing in America, it tends to be very capital intensive, knowledge intensive. The, st uh, the folks got to have you know, a lot of numeracy, problem solving skills, some advanced math, good communication skills. And they say, God, I can't find, they go to the communities in America, they can't find the young folks that have that skill set. At the same time, so, at the same time, I worry, and I bet President Kim worries as well, that with the um, lingering uh, economic woes, really economic despair, that there's increasing emphasis on training and less on educating. And I like to make the distinction between going to college to be educated and going to college to be trained. And I think that the genius of America, uh, throughout the last century and into this century, has been what our people, uh, what our educated people, have been able to do. And the more and more we emphasize training and the less we emphasize education, I think the more we even more imperil ourselves as we go forward in the economy. So can I, I agree, but what I think, when I think of training, I think it's the reading, writing, and arithmetic in my mind. Oh, that's, okay, what, fine. that's what a lot of these oh, okay. manufacturers and other companies, that's, that's what they say they're, they're looking for. Go ahead, even, go ahead respond. Well, you could do better than that. You could do better than <laughs> Bain Capital or a newspaper. No, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to want to hire people who have their own ideas and who can think. And I don't really want to tell them what to know because I know how to do what I already know how to do. And I want to hear the new ideas and the new thinking in my place, even though it's a newspaper in an antediluvian 19th century industry. I still want to have new ideas and creative thinking, and I think most employers want that as well. But you know, there's the uh, one, one, my, my wife happens to be the president of America's Promise, you know, Colin Powell's youth organization, and which is fighting the high school dropout crisis. And what and the problem is is that as you point out, kids in the in the ninth grade have see no connection between yeah. their ba their education and any kind of future. And so having and a number of businesses actually have stood up and brought kids into hotels to see what the hospitality industry is like, into high-tech industries to see what engineering is like and stuff like that. 
but, but it could really be done on a much more broad scale to keep those kids connected and to show them that, they're, that, that going to school is, you know, has a purpose. But you know, across the board on education, I mean, the, 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 the ACT results showed that only 25% of the kids who took the ACT are qualified for college work. Now, if that is not an argument for <coughs> education reform, I do not know what is. However, all these Republican <coughs> candidates want to get Washington out of education, and some of them want to demolish the Department of Education. Anyway, uh, end of editorial. Next, uh, next question. <coughs> Anybody? Um, you, you mentioned that because of Chris Christie's um, endorsement that that's going to have an effect. Um, because of that, do you think that all the candidates' eyes are going to be on Mitt Romney trying to turn the tables on him? I guess, how much of an effect do you think that's going to have in tonight's debate? No. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I missed the question. Um, repeat the question. Um, just the fact, Chris Christie's endorsement of Mitt Romney, kind of how much of an effect do you think that's going to have in tonight's debate? Do you think all eyes are going to be on Mitt Romney because of that? I think so. You know, the, the debates have been remarkably important uh, so far. They, they essentially ended Tim Pawlenty's candidacy. Uh, and the candidates are not really taking questions from journalists, so this is the only forum uh, where, the, where they kind of get put on the spot and have to um, distinguish themselves. Uh, and Romney has gotten a pass in the last two or three debates. Everyone's been, been ganging up on Perry. Uh, I think the other candidates are going to realize it's coming down to Romney and one, maybe two other people, and they need to get into that spot, and that means going after Romney. Um, so I, I, I do think uh, it will, it will in, increase the urgency uh, uh, of going after Romney for the other campaigns. Do you think any, do, who, who do you think is the likeliest not, not Romney in the race? Well, I mean, that's the other thing. Uh, Perry has sort of seemed like, uh, he, you know, he's, he's has some sort of mental disability at the, at the previous <laughs> debates. I'm, I'm sorry, it's true. He, he, he's not a very practiced uh, uh, public speaker on, on issues that are not related to Texas. Uh, and, and so he, he, came, he came in. Uh, he seemed to be the, the great hope, and his standing has diminished in, in each debate um, because people are kind of looking at him and going, well, whoa, what's that all about? Um, and, and part of it is he's just he, he been governor for 10 years, uh, hasn't been focused on um, the, the more national issues. Uh, and so, he, I mean, his policy people are stuffing him like a Christmas turkey with new information, and you, he's, you can tell he's just fried. He, he doesn't have it. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't have things together. So, um, so, and, Herman, and so, so is Herman Cain going to be? Is Michelle Bachman going to make a comeback? Does Huntsman have a prayer? I think all three are potential alternatives. Really? Yeah, they'll all have. The, they've all had their moment, and they'll have another moment, and then we'll see who survives. Any thoughts? I'll be watching with keen interest. Okay, I think I think we all will. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much for coming.